morning. It's September 1st. This is Labor Day weekend, kind of the sort of the unofficial end of summer, right? Everything's starting up again. Schools are starting. Like the, the long, slow sleep of the church during the summer, this is when we start to awaken and, and we uh, begin again. Uh, we, we start some of the old the programs that we that we used to do or we do every year but sometimes fall off in the summer that we uh, start thinking of new things. And that's where I am today is, is I'm wondering as we go into this new program year of the church, I, for the lack of a better term, what are we being called to? What's the, the new thing that's calling us forward as a community of faith, um, as a community together? What is God calling us into uh, to serve each other, to serve our community, to serve God? What new thing are we being called into this year? I feel like this is a, a year that's full of possibilities. I feel like this is a year when so much can awaken in this place to shine a light for our whole community. And I, I'm just seriously looking forward to what we might accomplish together. Um, now, I, I know September 1st is sort of an arbitrary, you know, it's like, well, we're going to decide everything kind of wakes up again on September 1st. We're going to start having meetings again. We're going to start doing all. But we can let this also be a time when God breathes new life into our hearts and reminds us that the cycle continues. Uh, the cycle of, of growth and regeneration, the cycle of God making all things new through us. So this is a time that we can dream together about what we might be that's the same as what we were, the same, you know, feeding the hungry and sheltering those who, who need shelter and all the things that we've done to bless the community for so long. But also, what's new? What's next? What can we do that will surprise even ourselves? As we think about that, uh, I just want to let you know that you're welcome here. You're welcome here if you're having a good morning or if you'd still rather be asleep. You're welcome if you're in your Sunday bath or if you're in your pajamas or if you're somewhere in between. You're welcome if you are a fully committed Christian or if you're just trying to wrap your mind around all of this. You're welcome if you're single or married or divorced. You're welcome if you're male or female, cis, trans, binary, non-binary. You're welcome if you're gay, straight, bi, questioning. You're just welcome. You're welcome in the completeness of who you are. God's child invited into relationship with God by God and loved completely for who you are at this time, who you have been, and who you will yet become. You are welcome and you are loved. I, I, I suspect that you'll notice that the front of the uh, bulletin has lots of barbecue type products on it. Um, and the sermon that's called There's Something Missing, and of course the 11th hour, uh, the sermon title changed to Mind the Gap, and so the imagery is a little bit different, but we'll go through it all. It all works out, it all works out the same way. Uh, we're just going to, you know, we're going to be adaptable, right? We're going to come to church and, and be full of Sunday surprise. <laughs> welcome. You're welcome in this place. Good morning. There are several announcements this morning that I want to call your attention to. Uh, first and foremost, anybody who has all the people that are signed up as liturgists who read the scriptures, etc., can we have a very short, please meet us in the front of the sanctuary right after worship with Pastor Steve uh, for a, a very, very brief meeting. So this week, we have um, trustees on Tuesday night. If you can't attend, let Ann Motley know. And on Wednesday evening, on Zoom, the Staff Parish Relations Committee will be meeting. And I also want to mention uh, the nice insert uh, next Sunday. Those of you that have read the book, Daughter of Cana, we'd like to have a book discussion. So just bring a simple lunch, and we'll meet in Jane's room and talk about the book. And that's next Sunday following worship. 
there's an insert in your bulletin because as, as our mission of the church, yes, we do a lot on Tuesday evening, but as you can see, part of our mission work here at the church is to share our building with other organizations and people. And uh, I think this list, comprehensive list, has been put together very nicely, and it gives you an idea of what's going on. If you, you know, are in the church at, at different times, you may, you'll understand who some of these groups are. Are there any other announcements? Then let us worship. just come from the fountain I've just come from the fountain Lord I've just come from the fountain his name so sweet I've just come from the fountain I've just come from the fountain Lord I've just come from the fountain his name so sweet Oh, brother, do you love Jesus? Yes, yes, I do love my Jesus. Brother, do you love Jesus? His name so sweet. Oh, Lord, I've just come from the fountain. I've just come from the fountain. Lord, I've just come from the fountain. His name so sweet. All right, let's join in the call to worship. A mystery beyond us calls to us. Our busy minds can't perceive it. But it calls to us, and we must answer. So, Holy One, we gather to worship you. We gather to listen and wonder and blossom with your grace. Amen. Let's pray together. God of grace, you give us your law not to restrict us, but to set us free. Help us by your grace to hear and understand, to listen and discern, to know and to choose wisely by your Holy Spirit, your word in Christ. 
alive in us. Guide us in the way of your wisdom. Amen. Let's sing together. Let inward love guide every deed. Right. That's how that works. Inward love guides many of my deeds. I mean, I try to make it all of my deeds, but, you know, that works right up until somebody cuts me off in traffic. That works right up until, you know, somebody hustles a little faster than I do and gets to the checkout lane at Walmart right as it's opening as I'm trying to work my way in. That works right up until, you know, somebody gives me a look that I don't find acceptable. Inward love guides some of my deeds, I guess is what I'm saying. I'd like it to guide more, right? I'd like to open my heart to a place where God can fill me up and help me let inward love guide more of my deeds. And I pray, I pray every day that that moment comes. It hasn't happened yet. But we're all a work in progress. John Wesley would say that we're all on the path toward Christian perfection. And the most important part about being on the path is that we stay on the path. And the most significant part about being on the path toward Christian perfection is that we recognize that we're not there yet. 
And that's okay, because God continues to lead us forward. And so when we do, you know, let inward love guide less of our deeds than we would like, God says, I get it. I understand. I love you. I forgive you. Come walk the path with me. So we can bring our confession before God, knowing that God hears, that God loves, and that God does indeed set us free. Let's pray together. We confess what is within us is a mixture of love and fear. God, open us our inward lives that we may see clearly and be made new. Help us see clearly what within us is born of love and what is born of our wants and fears. By your grace, transform our inner desires that what flows from our hearts may be love and healing and the grace of Christ. Let's take time for those prayers we keep silently in our hearts. Now we take a second to stand up, turn to someone next to you and say, may the grace and healing of Christ flow from me to you. May the grace and healing of Christ flow from me to you. Oh, stand up. May some scripture. <laughs> Morning. Our first reading scripture is taken from Psalms 45, 1 to 2 and 6 to 9. My heart overflows with a goodly theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. The royal scepter is the scepter of equity. Your love, righteousness, and hate, wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your compassion. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory, palaces, string instruments made you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At the right hand stands the queen of gold of offer. Our gospel reading is taken from Mark 7, 1 to 8, 14 to 15, 21 to 23. You may stand if you're able. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands. That is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands. Thus, observing the tradition of the elders, and they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash. And there are some, there are also many of the tradition that they observe. The washing of cup and pots and bronze cattles and beds. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? 
He said to them, Isaiah prophesied, rightly about you hypocrites, it is written, these people honors me with their lips, but your hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandments of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowds again and said to them, Listen to me, all you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but that can't, by things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, good, uh, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defiled a person. The word of God for the people of God. The other day I was at Walmart, and you know, any story that begins with the other day I was at Walmart is going to be interesting at least. So the other day I was at Walmart, and I was walking down the aisle that goes in front of the electronics section, and there was a guy coming toward me pushing his cart, um, and his, I, I think his daughter, I guess his daughter was 
hanging off the front of the cart, you know, outside the cart, holding on to the front backwards. You know, you know how that works, right? Anyway, he's coming toward me, but uh, he had no idea that he was coming toward me because he was glued to his phone. He was sort of pushing the cart with one hand and, and staring at his phone. I thought he was going to plow right into me, but he didn't. Instead, he plowed his cart and, of course, his daughter right into a display of televisions that was right in the middle of the aisle, right? Big ones, like obviously really unmissable televisions. He could not possibly miss this display of televisions right there out in front for everyone to see. Boom! I swear, when he looked up from his phone, after he crashed his daughter into the TVs and many of the TVs sort of, you know, collapsed to the floor, he looked annoyed. Like somehow it was somebody else's fault. I was thinking, man, there's a whole world going on around you. You might want to check it out sometime. You got to pay attention. I mean, I, I use my phone a lot, sure. I, use, I really do, maybe not as much as some of the members of my family, but I use my phone a lot. But I usually keep my attention focused on the world going on around me because there's something beautiful going on in the world all around you all the time. And if, even if there's not immediately obvious beautiful things going on, well, at least, you know, paying attention is safe. Staggering blindly through the Walmart is not it's not safe for you. It's not safe for others. In fact, staggering blindly toward anything in life isn't safe. Whether you're distracted by your phone or something else, we really need to pay attention to our surroundings. One of my favorite stories is something that my brother Mike did to a friend of his. We'll call him Joe because his name's Joe. So uh, my brother is walking down the street with his friend Joe, and Joe is sort of on the outside of the sidewalk, and they're walking, and Joe is, is he's, he's looking at my brother, and they're arguing about something, but he's looking at my brother, um, and my brother realizes this, so he's walking down, and as he walks, he sort of, sort of angles his gait a little bit, he angles his path, um, and Joe, who is only looking at Mike, keeps the same distance, walks right into a telephone pole. My brother steered the poor guy right into a telephone pole on purpose. Joe hit the pole, and then he hit the ground. you got to pay attention to what's going on around you. It reminds me of London, the underground. You ever been to London or seen the underground, right? Every underground stage, underground's a subway in London. Every underground station, there's the gap between the platform and where the subway train is, and every single station says right there on the ground, mind the gap. Mind the gap. Be careful. Be aware. Mind the gap. I always mind, I try at least always to mind the gap. I stay aware of my surroundings because, well, our surroundings, they can be dangerous. Or at least embarrassing, I guess, depending on our surroundings and our circumstance upon interacting with those surroundings. Of course, one of my problems is that I'm likely to lose my focus peering into the gap, right? So I get distracted by minding the gap in the first place because I like details and I like to ask why. Because asking why leads to more detail and sometimes you can get lost in the very gap that you're trying to mind because details live in the gap. Our lectionary passage from the gospel this morning was kind of strange. Uh, it began with the Pharisees going after Jesus for what his followers were doing, actually rather what his followers were not doing. Uh, you know, of course, that the Hebrew scriptures made it impossible to eat, well, a lot of good stuff, right? Like the pig in all of its glory was absolutely forbidden. No pork, no sausage, <laughs> no bacon. What kind of God would deny us bacon? Anyway, that's the most famous, well, maybe that and shellfish are the kind of the most famous of the dietary restrictions of the Hebrew Scriptures, but in fact, there were tons of them. Um, it must have been hard for devout Jews to just to keep it all straight. And on top of the Scriptures, they added on traditions, traditions that made it even harder to keep it all straight. It's one of those traditions that the Pharisees here were sort of perturbed about, because some of Jesus' followers were ignoring this tradition. 
don't get me wrong, like the tradition they're talking about in this particular case doesn't seem like a terrible idea, right? And now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of Jesus' disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Now, if we've learned anything from the past several years, it's that washing your hands is a pretty good idea on a regular basis. And the Pharisees saw the followers of Jesus eating without washing their hands, and they were just, frankly, they were appalled. I mean, I guess I am too, kind of, right? I mean, although we should remember that we have this wonderful thing called indoor plumbing and, like, soap dispensers, right? We can, it's pretty easy for us to wash our hands, certainly much easier than it was in first century Israel. Anyway, the Pharisees and the scribes, they noticed that some of Jesus' followers were not washing their hands before they ate. And they said, why? Why do you let your followers ignore this tradition? To which Jesus replied, of course, oh, shut up. No, not really. Well, actually, he kind of did, right? He said to them, uh, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. And that, of course, opens huge, huge doors. It's that there's no one, there's no one anywhere, and there never has been anywhere, any time in history and life, there has never been anybody who has been able to obey the Jewish scriptures completely. We talk about the Ten Commandments, but there are 613 commandments. And it was impossible to even remember them all, much less obey them all. Is anyone here, right here and right now, wearing a cotton polyester blend? Well, you're breaking God's commandment. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your animals breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two different kinds of seeds, nor shall you put on a garment made of two different materials. So, no animals breeding with different breeds. There's a lot of dog breeders who are crying right now, having read that, right? When sowing your fields with different types of seeds. Anyone here keep a garden? One of this, like, just vegetables, right? I actually, uh, just this week, I ordered a hydroponic garden. Um, it hasn't come yet. It's coming on Wednesday. But it's got nine pods, right? And I guess I'm going to have a lot of tomatoes because I plant tomatoes and herbs side by side because God told me not to. Should not put on a garment made of different materials. I say cotton polyester all the time, but what about silk blends? What about cotton and wool? Yeah, so if breaking God's commandment leads to a one-way ticket to the hot spot, we're all getting on the down escalator, right? I mean, there are reasons for those commandments, reasons that the dietary restrictions existed, that the two different materials things existed. There are reasons for those, reasons we know, and that I'd be happy to discuss with any of you over, you know, a cup of coffee or a pint of beer. Just give me a shout. We'll talk about it. But for now, the important thing to know is that the Pharisees were angry again, and Jesus told them off again. And then, in our reading, well, we don't actually know what happened next because in our reading, uh, the lectionary skips a few verses. You notice there was like three different sections of verses this morning? The words that we skipped shine a light on the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, and I don't think that was what the makers of the lectionary really intended us to get from the Scripture this morning. So they skipped it. There's a, there's a gap. And we picked up again, and Jesus made the statement I think they really wanted us to think about here, where after he responded to the Pharisees, he addressed his followers. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. And I think that is what the lectionary creators were hoping that we'd get out of this morning. It's probably what most churches are going to hear about this morning. What really defiles humanity isn't what we eat, but what we say and what we do and how we live. But this morning, I'm not interested in that. Well, I am interested in that. But that's not our topic for today. Because today, I, I got fixated on another detail. Actually, I got mind caught in minding another gap. And there is a gap here. And it's interesting. After verse 15, our lectionary reading picks up again. Our lectionary reading picks up again at 21, where Jesus lays out what files humanity, not what we put into our bodies, but like shellfish or, or bacon, 
but what comes out of our bodies. Now, I don't mean, you know, number one or number two, although if you read this scripture, Jesus was absolutely making a bathroom joke here, and it's pretty hilarious. But I mean, I think that Jesus meant what comes out of our bodies that emanates from our hearts. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. But before that passage, and believe me, uh, we'll have sermons sort of ad nauseum on why theft, murder, wickedness, deceit, and slander are bad, and, you know, why bacon is good, but that's not the topic for today. Because before this list of verses, in the gap of the lectionary, for the first time, not too long ago, I noticed another gap. The New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the scripture that I was posting this morning, does not have a Mark chapter 7, verse 16. If you look in the Bible, it goes from Mark chapter 7, verse 15, to Mark chapter 7, verse 16. 17. It's like buildings that don't have a 13th floor. For some reason, it feels like verse 16 was left out. And so I checked, right? And the latest edition of the New International Version, the New International Reader's Version, the Common English Bible, the Good News Translation, Eugene Peterson's The Message, and a lot more, they don't have Mark chapter 7, verse 16 either. The American Standard Bible does, and of course, King Jimmy's got it. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 16 from King James, if any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And you've heard that phrase before. Because Jesus said it kind of a lot. Uh, to my count, those words, or a close variation, were recorded two other times in Mark's gospel, three times in Matthew's, twice in Luke, and something like eight times in the Revelation to John. Either Jesus said that a lot, or a lot of people said that a lot. So why is it not here in the NRSV or the NIV or the NIRV or the Common English Bible? Why isn't it there? Why, in fact, does not Mark 7, 16 exist in most modern translations of the Bible? That's the, the gap I fell into, is figuring that out. Why should we pay attention to the fact that it's missing from those Bibles? Why should we mind that gap? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward, actually. Mark chapter 7, verse 16 existed in many of the ancient manuscripts from which some of the biblical translations were built. However, at some point, scholars discovered far older documents, uh, and a great number of them, and they all matched. And these more ancient versions of the scriptures of Mark's gospel that were unearthed, well, that, well they didn't have chapters and verses back then, but that sentence did not exist in the most ancient versions of the scriptures that they could find. And so when more modern translations occurred, it's not that they omitted verse 16, it's that somewhere along the way, some of those ancient Greek manuscripts added it in. And that's where I went down the rabbit hole. Because I had to ask why. I had to ask why did they add that in? I mean, there could be a number of reasons, right? Uh, I doubt it was nefarious. Uh, it could have been some scribe who just was having a long day. His mind wandered. Jesus said that kind of a lot. He got there. He needed some coffee. He didn't have any coffee, and he accidentally wrote it down. I mean, it could be as simple as that. Or maybe at some point, someone was relating the story word of mouth, and they slipped it in just to, to make sure that, uh, that it got some emphasis. Whoever was writing it down wrote down what the teacher said. Oh, it seems reasonable. Maybe, and they did this, right? Maybe uh, it was something a scribe scribbled down in, like, the margins, a note to themselves to sort of remember it for later on. I mean, people write in their Bibles all the time. Who here has a Bible that you've written in? Anyone? You should see my books from seminary. They're full. They're lousy with, well, the ones I read. They're lousy with notes. They got stuff in them all the time. So they do this. Maybe someone just wrote it down in a margin, and someone else was transcribing it later on, and they just copied it down because it was there. And there are any number of reasons. But it could be something else. And there are a few places in the Gospels where the disciples kind of went after Jesus a bit. Remember some of these places, right? 
Uh, Jesus would tell a parable, tell some story, and the disciples were like, <laughs> what did you just say? I have no idea what that meant. In a few of those places, when, when Jesus finished telling the story, and he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Right? And then he would go off alone with disciples, and they would basically say, look, we have literally no idea what you were talking about. And he said, I'll explain it to you, my followers. I'll explain it to you, my disciples. Maybe some scribe thought it was important, or sorry, impertinent to question Jesus, unless he invited the questioning. And so maybe slipping that line in there was sort of somehow uh, that the scribe made it okay for the disciples to question Jesus. I don't know. They slipped it in right before when he had left the crowd and entered the house, Jesus' disciples asked him about the parable. Who knows? We don't know. We can't know. Uh, personally, I don't think it was any of those things. Personally, and I don't know for sure, of course, but personally, I think the answer is far, far simpler. I think that Mark 7, verse 16, just got added by someone deliberately who simply wanted us to pay attention to that passage, who wanted to make sure that when we heard people say, listen to me all Nothing outside a person that going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. That passage ended with one more emphasis to keep their attention. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. I think whoever added it thought it was so important that they wanted to make sure that it caught our attention. And so they changed the scripture. They added in. Do you find that shocking? I don't find it shocking. I don't think it is. It's not that shocking. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a Wesleyan, and I believe, as did our founders, that everything necessary for salvation is contained within scriptures. I believe that they are holy and that we need to pay attention to them. We need to revere them as the poetry that continues God's revelation in Christ that teaches us. I believe scripture was inspired by God, but not written by God, right? It was written by human beings with human understandings and human agendas. And those agendas, uh, shaped in response to communities to whom the authors were writing those words, are why we have magi giving gifts to the king in Matthew and no shepherds, and shepherds uh, receiving the first Noel from the angels in Luke, but no magi. And because scripture was written by humans with human understandings and human agendas, it's imperfect. And it certainly has changed over uh, the years of oral traditions to the first writings, to subsequent copies, to our translations today. I mean, if we were uh, to say that it is a sin to change Scripture, we'd all have to go learn Hebrew, Aramaic, and Koine Greek. Because you don't need to spend too much time studying before you figure out how our translations have changed Scriptures significantly. But that's okay. Because, like John Wesley, I believe all Scripture to be inspired by God. And like John Wesley, I believe that we, God's people, get some of that same gift of inspiration when we read Scripture. So maybe some scribe somewhere along the way uh, was inspired by the Holy Spirit and possibly, you know, a craving for bacon. When he added that sentence, let any who has ears to hear listen to this section that says essentially we, the followers of Christ, we don't need to adhere to the dietary restrictions of ancient Judaism. Because it's not what we put into us that defiles us, but what comes out. And it's so important that we remember that, friends, because some of the things that come out of us, that defile us, they start in the Bible. Those books, those 66 documents that were selected by a committee from hundreds of accounts of Jesus and the Christian life, written by possibly hundreds, if not thousands, of different people over different times and in different places, each with their own context and each with their own agendas, to shape their perspective in their writing. Are these writings important? Absolutely, they're extremely important. Are they foundational to our faith and our understanding of God? Absolutely they are. Are they the literal, infallible word of God? No. The Word of God is no book or collection of books. However important those books may be, the Word of God is Christ himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. The uh, Christian theologian and author C.S. Lewis put it this way. 
It is Christ himself and not the Bible who is the true word of God. The Bible, read in the right spirit and with the right guidance of good teachers, will bring us to him. But we must not use the Bible as a sort of encyclopedia out of which texts can be taken to use as weapons. The books of the Bible were written by people. Just, you know, poor, wayward people who listened to the whisper of the Holy Spirit and wrote in response to the Spirit's guidance. And maybe they reflected the best wisdom of the time, we, but we can't blindly follow along with those words, you know, like a distracted dad in Walmart pushing his cart into a, a, a wall of televisions. Because so much of what is written in the Bible by any modern standards is simply wrong. Slavery, bigotry, hatred, slaughter. And I couldn't function without cotton polyester. And I believe that I have made my feelings on bacon crystal clear. But joking aside, Scripture opens the door to the abject oppression of women and children, the reduction of children to possessions with no value, no rights, and no agency at all, discrimination against our LGBTQIA sisters and brothers living as God intended them to live. The Bible can be and is used as a weapon, bludgeoning rather than comforting, marginalizing rather than drawing wide the circle to embrace all of humanity with our reflection of God's unfathomable grace. And friends, we have to mind the gap because we can't be those people. We can't be those Christians. We can't be the ones who let these ancient words with their antiquated, archaic, and sometimes irrelevant understandings enable us to hide bigotry behind religious dogma. We have to mind the gaps. We have to mind the gaps between what we read in these books and what God-given reason and experiences and compassion will tell us is the true intent of God for humanity in relationship with God and in relationship with each other. We have to look into the margins, into the place where people live between the text and the intent and let the Holy Spirit guide us as we interpret these powerful, these meaningful, these foundational but not infallible ancient words to help us build communities of faith and compassion, of commitment and compromise, of love and of grace on earth as it is in heaven. We have to look into the gaps. We have to mind the gaps. Because in those gaps lies Jesus' intent for us to love one another as he has loved us. And in his name. Will you pray with me? God of profound love, creator of all that is, giver of grace and mercy and compassion and justice. We thank you for these words that you've given us that have lasted thousands of years, that paint a beautiful picture, a lovely poem of who you are, that lead us to you and what it is to worship you and to live in your way. Help us to have hearts just as wide as can be. Help us to use our reason to interpret the distance that lies between the words written by people with understandings that don't match what we understand today, the words that they wrote and the intent that you gave. Help us to bridge that gap so that we can carry your love forward into our community, so that we can teach people what it is to love the God who loves them, who gave everything for them, who sacrificed for them, and to help each other learn what it means to love each other as you have loved us. Help us, Lord, to use these words and your inspiration in our lives as we read them to build your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It is in our Savior's name that we pray. Amen.
Now uh, it is time to recognize the gift of grace that God has given us. We see grace all around us. I mean, grace in God's mercy is everywhere. God's love surrounds us. But nowhere probably in our lives is grace made more manifestly present to us than it is at this table. This gift that God has given us, that Christ gave to us to remind us of Christ's incredible love, of Christ's sacrifice, to remind us of the cross, yes, but also of the empty tomb and Jesus stepping back out into life and reminding us that there is nothing, there is literally nothing that can overcome the power of God's love. Nothing anywhere. And so we invite you to this table. It's not, of course, uh, our table. It's not the table of First United Methodist Church of Pittsfield. It's not the table of the United Methodist Church. It's not the table of the Christian Church. This is the table of Christ. And everyone is invited. It doesn't matter where you are in your faith journey, if you're a lifelong Christian, or if you haven't even begun yet, we in the United Methodist Church recognize that this can be what we call a converting ordinance. That even if you've never, ever experienced the presence of Christ in a real way for you in the taking of this bread and this cup, you can feel Christ come alive in your life. And so everyone, everyone is welcome at this table. And so let us begin. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, you remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to the church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by, the, by water and spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and shared it out among his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he shared it out among his disciples, saying, Take and drink ye every one of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this every time that you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory are yours, God Almighty, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one. For we all partake in the one loaf, and the loaf that we share is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blessing of Christ for us. And now the table is set. But all who wish to dine, come forward. We will partake this morning through intention. You will come forward and you'll be given a piece of bread which you will dip in the cup and then eat. Um, we also have both gluten-free and uh, dairy-free version. If anybody needs that, um, simply ask and we can provide that as well. Um, but the table is set. Come forward and dine.
Let's pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. any prayer requests we'd like to share with the community this morning? Okay. Thoughts and prayers to the family of William Daniel Holliday. He likes to be called Dan, and my veteran group calls him Doc. Sure. Dan Holliday, we uh, ask God to, to give comfort and strength, and, and uh, our thoughts and prayers are with as well. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Thank you, Brian. A, a, couple, a couple of good friends of mine, uh, one I play golf with, uh, he's had bone cancer in his final week of treatment. He's getting through it. My bridge partner, Sally, she's got uh, colon cancer. God to be with them, to give them healing and strength, and a reminder that they don't walk the road alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, when we are brand new to our discipleship, we hardly wait to be sent out on mission for Christ. We're eager to proclaim, to shout God's praise to the people, to comfort, to guide, and to heal. But time takes its toll on us. We begin to let doubt assail our enthusiasm, and then we hear Mark's gospel message. Jesus is ridiculed by his hometown people. They can't imagine that one of their number could actually be God's chosen one. They're focusing on what they know. He is a carpenter, the son of a carpenter, the brother to James, John, and the other disciples. I just completely lost it. <laughs> I just short-circuited a little bit. It happens. We're just going to let God guide us through this. God, we thank you for this day, for the beauty in the world around us. We thank you for the weather that we've had recently that has reminded us of the, the sun that shines from you, that gives the gift of life to all of the earth. We thank you for the rain that helps things to grow, and a reminder that as the seasons shift, our world changes around us in, in so many wonderful ways. But your love for us never changes. As we go through the rest of this year and we, we experience fall and we go into winter and then the year changes and we go into spring, the, the weather changes, but your love is constant. We thank you for being with us, for being at our side through all that we do, for walking with us through all of the, the seasons that we have to walk through that aren't seasons of weather, but seasons of life, seasons of grief, seasons of mourning, seasons of, of pain, seasons of illness seasons of joy, that you are our constant companion through all the seasons that we endure in this world. We thank you for your presence. And we pray that you help us to feel it more closely. And as we feel it more closely, we pray that you give us the strength and the courage to share it with others so that through us, others can experience the love and the grace and the compassion, the mercy, the forgiveness that you give to us. God, just guide us as we continue in our journey of discipleship so that we can help lead others on the path that leads to you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our mission moment on Sunday morning is when we bring our gifts to the altar to further the mission of the church. The ushers will wait upon you following the doxology.
seated if you're able for the doxology. join in the prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for all that you are for us. By your spirit, may the grace that is in our hearts shine out through our words and actions and all our choices. Send us into the world to share your love for the sake of the redemption of the world in the name and spirit of Christ. Amen. Mind the gap. There's, there's a gap sometimes between what we're taught and our lived reality. There's a gap sometimes between what we read and what we know God calls us to. And all of these things are valuable. All of these things are important in teaching us how to live as God's people. But God gives us the gift of inspiration so we can mind the gap. And we can, uh, instead of seeing the limitations that Scripture can impose, we can be opened to the wide open reality of God's love and God's grace that extends so far beyond anything we could possibly imagine. Mind the gap and go into the world full of God's love to share God's grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and abide with you forevermore. And all of God's children say amen. Let's sing together.